got a future in the army. You'll get a bonus, stay in the army. Do you ever stop to think about some of the services and recreational facilities most of us take for granted while in service? I'm talking about such things as libraries, bowling alleys, game rooms, and golf courses. They're found at most military installations around the world. Special services. Con Tung, in the central highlands of Vietnam, is also of strategic importance to the North Vietnamese. Taking the capital city will effectively let them cut South Vietnam in half. Defending Con Tung are two corps, led by Lieutenant General Ngo Tzu and the U.S. 2nd Regional Assistance Group, led by civilian advisor Lieutenant Colonel John Paul Van. Van receives intelligence of an impending battle earlier in the year and has increased B-52 attacks in February and March, while Tzu gathers his ARVN forces for the coming doom. On April 23rd, in the midst of the Easter Offensive, the North Vietnamese attack nearby Tan Khan, protected by South Vietnam's 22nd Division. Enemy tanks and artillery are no match for the panicking 22nd. As the North Vietnamese tanks roll in on Tan Khan in two columns the next day, the 900 support troops of the 22nd panic and start to flee. With no hope, for an air extraction, and most of the unit trapped in the base, it is chaotic. Much of this, as Lieutenant Colonel Van notes when he arrives in Tan Khan in his helicopter under heavy fire, is the lack of composure from the 22nd's Colonel Dot. Van evacuates roughly 50 wounded and many civilians, and then does his best to rally the ground troops who are becoming quickly overwhelmed by the invading forces. For this, as well as his directing airstrikes on enemy tank and anti-aircraft positions, Lieutenant Colonel Van becomes the first civilian since World War II to be awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. The North Vietnamese continue on their way to Tan Khan, and Van fears for the army led by an already panicking Tzu. Van relieves Tzu and takes control of the ARVN-2 Corps' force. Tzu is sent off to Saigon and replaced by Major Tuan. Also brought in is Colonel Ba and his experienced 23rd ARVN Division. On May 13th, enemy artillery and tanks attack Kontum from both the north and south. They are repelled by both M72 LAW missile launchers and TOW missiles. The light anti-tank weapon is a portable single-shot weapon to be disposed after firing its payload, a 66-millimeter anti-tank missile. Weighing only five and a half pounds, the LAW could withstand the elements as the rocket was sealed in the launch tube. It will prove itself crucial in Contum. The North Vietnamese continue to attack, on and off, for the next three days. On May 16th, they are relentlessly bombed by a B-52, breaking their forward momentum. Van will direct 300 B-52 strikes to the course of the battle. Attacks keep coming over the next two weeks, culminating in the final battle for Contum. May 26th. 1972. It is early morning. The North Vietnamese begin their attack on Kontum from the north with both tank and infantry. Air support from a claw helicopter destroys nine tanks, two machine guns, and a truck. The attack halts barely after sunrise. But as darkness falls, the North Vietnamese step up their game and attack once more. Two B-52 strikes neutralized them. May 27, 1962. The 44th Regiment awaken the next morning to find enemy tanks 50 yards from their bunker. There was, it seems, a flaw in the defensive perimeter. If the tanks make it further, 
They will invade Kontun and take the city. They are stopped by LAW missiles. The next day, the North Vietnamese manage to take over a number of buildings and bunkers in the city. They are, however, on their own as supplies are cut off by the Allies' air support. Beaten, the North Vietnamese begin a retreat by June 6th. What is left of their forces are cleaned out in a building-to-building -building sweep by South Vietnamese forces. On June 9th, the city of Con Tum is declared fully secure. A tragic footnote involves Lieutenant Colonel Van. As he is carried in his helicopter from Victory that night, his pilot fails to see a stand of trees in the fog. Well, I worked the burn unit one time for a while, and we had 75 to 85 percent chop, uh, burns from chopper pilots who went down with their plane, with their choppers, and we would have to go in, mask, gown, gloves, etc. We'd take sterile water, we'd wash their bodies down, then we'd take these big jars of what we called sulfur myelon, which was an antibiotic cream, put our hands in it and just literally ice down their bodies with this cream. At age 47, Lieutenant Colonel Van is killed in the resulting helicopter explosion. The chief pallbearer at his funeral is none other than General Westmoreland himself. President Nixon posthumously grants Lieutenant Colonel Van the Presidential Medal of Freedom. The citation reads, Soldier of peace and patriot of two nations, the name of John Paul Van will be honored as long as free men remember the struggle to preserve the independence of South Vietnam. June 17, 1972. Back in Washington, D.C., the security guard for the Democratic National Committee's Watergate headquarters notices signs of a break-in. Tape is placed over the building's locks. When the police arrive, they catch five burglars who have connections to President Nixon's committee to re-elect the president. They had been setting up wiretaps on DNC phones and photocopying secret documents. April 30th, 1973. Last June 17, while I was in Florida trying to get a few days rest after my visit to Moscow, I first learned from news reports of the Watergate break-in. I was appalled at this senseless, illegal action. And I was shocked to learn that employees of the re-election committee were apparently among those guilty. I immediately ordered an investigation by appropriate government authorities. On September 15, as you'll recall, indictments were brought against seven defendants in the case. Nixon will deny any connection with the Watergate break-in. But for days after, the president had secretly provided payoffs to the five burglars and two accomplices. His subsequent plans are to get the CIA to stop the FBI investigation. The Watergate scandal will not be the only thing that will come back to haunt the president. The nation is stunned when, in the June 19, 1972 edition of Newsweek, the magazine's Saigon bureau chief, Kevin Buckley, and Alexander Shimkin exposed the military operation Speedy Express from December 1968 to May 1969. The operation was a land rush by the U.S. 9th Division designed to root out Viet Cong hostilities within Kien Hoa in the Mekong Delta province. The U.S. 9th Division's commander, Major General Julian Ewell, becomes known within the military as the Butcher of the Delta. He apparently views success in battle per body count amassed. Newsweek charges that nearly 5,000 civilians were killed throughout the operation. The death toll there, Buckley writes, 
made the My Lai Massacre look trifling in comparison. Speaking with the nearby civilian hospital in Ben Tre, Buckley notes that nearly 1,431 civilians are wounded by friendly fire in the course of Speedy Express. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.